Information provided in this podcast should not be considered investment advice. Please see our website pretosec.com slash compliance for a complete disclaimer and more information. Hi everyone and welcome to this podcast live from day two at Pretos 29th annual energy conference. Few if any teams have been higher on the agenda the past six months than the topic we are going to discuss right now that of energy security. Because what lies behind this? What is terawatt hours, gas, electricity, baseload? During the next 30 minutes, we will hopefully clarify some of the questions you have around this. I think we can start off with a very top-down question, and that is, how did we end up here? With me in the studio, I have uh, three Colleagues, that is uh, energy analyst Tom Erik Christensen. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome also to you, Bord uh, Rosef, also energy analyst in Preto. Thank you. And then the uh, power man himself, Lars Uwe Skorpen. Thank Welcome. you. <coughs> so, guys, how did Europe in particular end up in this situation? I think Europe ended up here. Uh, after more than a decade of access to very cheap energy, which of course is uh, fueling all other industries as well. So it's quite easy to take it for granted when it's there. But uh, at the same time, then we imported more and more from Russia. We uh, invested less and less ourselves and didn't really care that much about energy security because there was always ample gas supply to flex the grid in, in Europe and especially Germany. Uh, so uh, and then the, independ- the independence after after a while it becomes less and less. You get more and more dependent on all the sources, and then of course it becomes a huge problem and it disappears overnight. Yeah, because it's not like uh, demand for gas in Europe has exploded over the last decade. It's been flat to slightly declining. It's just that European production uh, is much much more down due to regulations um, and. Uh, Russia has supplied that gap. Because let's face it, we had the same discussion in 2014 with Russia. Yeah. We didn't take it serious enough. Or we just thought that that would be a reliable source of, of supply, which it has been, but up until this point, obviously. But I also think that, you know, Russia, uh, Russia is one thing, but uh, Germany has done a lot of, uh, you know, bad uh, judgment. They have phased out in reality their nuclear fleet. You know, they panicked when they saw what happened in Fukushima and they decided, let's close this down. Terrible uh, decision. They closed three last year. They're about to close three at the end of this year. That might not happen now, but you know, this is, this is really bad. And then replacing, uh, you know, base load that is regulated with unregulated intermittent solar and wind, that creates problems. I want to elaborate a bit on on uh, on the things you just said because base load, wind, solar, that is maybe not something that is on top of uh, all our listeners' mind. Okay, so so take solar and wind. Uh, it, it, we call that intermittent power, and the reason why we call that is that basically it comes on when the sun shines and when when the wind blows, but you don't control that, and, and that's the huge problem. And when you then take out power that you in reality control, and and coal obviously were meant to go and has more or less disappeared, but of course it's coming back again now also because uh, they they need power. But, but the problem is taking out everything that you can regulate with a lot of power that you are not able to regulate, then you get more dependent on Russian gas. That's just the way it is. Yeah, and I think also that uh, people have been a bit naive, of course. That's pretty obvious today where we stand now, but uh, it is very hard if you try to be nice to everyone and you say it's a free uh, system where you know uh, the lowest cost supplier can, can supply to you. And then over, over time, you know, then Russia gained market share because they sold us a lot of cheap gas. There was many times, you know, if you look at the oil market, there you have always had, or for a long, long time, several decades, OPEC that is kind of trying to push prices up. And, and, uh, and that 
several times in you know, the last years. So people have wondered why do Russia put so much gas into the European economy? Why don't they hold back a little? Because gas prices has been low for 10 years, basically. Much lower than people expected you know, on average. So why has that happened? Of course, because Russia has been interested in increasing market share, which means increasing the European dependence on their power. And, and of course, that when it comes to a point, it, that becomes a strategic resource for them. And I guess that was 55% for Germany alone, dependency on Russian gas, you know, it's a terrible mistake. Yeah, it's just just crazy, basically. So I think that they call it free market, the, the thinking that, you know, the lowest cost supplier uh, can just outcompete anything else. Um, those kind of minds. Also that, you know, we have, you don't really want to invest in oil and gas to supply internally in the EU, but you are fine importing it from someone else. Then, then you know you end up in a situation which is unsustainable long term, especially if uh, what you thought or hoped would become a trusted partner is not. But each and every country in Europe and especially Germany have probably been too naive in thinking of energy security and how important that actually is for national security. Yeah, definitely. I think I think so, and I think what a lot of people. Uh, don't that often probably think about this is all the industries that actually use this power you know that's fertilizer it's uh, steel aluminium it's, it's, it's a lot of the stuff we need to to either you know uh, grow food or, or uh, build buildings or uh, uh, all of all of the, the other industries depend on on the power as well you know that's why we have some of these uh, strong industries in Norway as well has been the access to cheap uh, hydropower so uh, of course then when uh, energy becomes scarce, it's, it's a huge problem, and that is what you're seeing in, in Europe now. It has been deflationary as well, right, when, when when energy is cheap, because you can produce cheaper, obviously, and you can sell your products cheaper out to the consumer, while right now that is that is by far the case. Um, I, think, I think in, I mean, politicians are always getting a lot of uh, heat, but... Uh, like uh, I think Otto Ulset in the uh, in the panel yesterday said like yeah I know what I should do but I don't know how to get re-elected doing that. Yeah, that was a very good comment. Yeah, I agree. And yeah. Uh, and, um, and and it's now, true. It's true. Yeah, you need to see a crisis before you can uh, can uh, really do what you should do because like now we have built no contingencies into the system. Uh, we're uh, focusing on intermittent power. We're focusing solely on reaching the one and a half uh, degree uh, increase target. There's a big difference between that and two degrees. We haven't sort of you haven't politically been able to say anything else. So we haven't built any uh, contingency into the system. That's exactly what we're we're seeing the effect of now. That actually brings me into my second question because it doesn't seem like everybody has fully taken into account the situation we're actually in because we're kind of throwing darts around and blaming I'm blaming you and you are blaming me but those are kind of we need, probably need to look at the map and see okay we are where we are what can we do what are the short-term solutions but even more importantly what can we do, do longer term in order to have a sustainable energy situation in Europe we're quite clear that you need more of everything like Lars Uwe knows better than anyone when when it's sun <coughs> in Spain there's no cheaper electrons than 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 those generated on top of the houses um, but it's not um, it's not uh, it's not always uh, sun in Spain so you, you need to plan for like changing environment yeah. and, and, and I and agree you need all of everything and I normally say you know uh, ele Electron always tried to reach Paris because that's where the price is highest uh, and of course we have a fantastic uh, uh, resource we have a very good wind condition offshore we should definitely get moving faster than we at least what it's looking right now because now we're th thinking about maybe the first kilowatt hours out of offshore wind in Norway would not be here before 2030. That's not a very ambition, uh, if you ask me. There are a lot of talks, but uh, too little action. I think also I saw Erna Solberg today is out uh, rethinking maybe the whole onshore wind thing. Uh, I think that she also and, and uh, with her many others that we also need to restart the onshore wind thing because in reality, new capacity in Norway, for instance, take Norway now, 
new capacity uh, of scale will have to be wind. It would have to be offshore wind, it will have to be onshore wind, and we should get going with both of those. Mm. Yeah, the, the problem, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's always the cheapest, and, and I think what's been the case, uh, at least for some period now, is that you try to disincentivize oil investments. Yeah. But when it's sunny, you know, those electrons are always cheaper. So you can even incentivize oil investments. The importance is how much you ins or how much you push on the renewables button. Not you shouldn't disincentivize other kinds of investments, which perhaps has been the case for since 2014 or so. But isn't this it's I discussed this with the uh, with Mr. Rahim uh, in Trafigura yesterday as well, that we have you have oil and gas investors, they would like cash back, dividends, no growth. Then you have renewables investors who obviously want growth because there's no cash back for the time being. But it's very difficult to see how the big majors, the energy majors in the world is not going to play a vital role also in the future in the broader energy sector. But when you have a uh, difference between the two segments you obviously get low multiple businesses like you have today and you can't set aside enough capital for growth which is what we actually need tom eric yeah no i think that's that's completely clear and i think people have to keep in mind some of the energy majors in europe for instance that's some of the biggest companies in the world also in terms of scale and what they can do in terms of size of projects so um, I think one good example uh, here in Norway is, is Equinor that you know is is doing quite a lot in renewables now. Of course, of course, a bit too late. You know, they they could have been even earlier than their offshore wind division would have been like Ørsted today. But but they are moving fast now, and I think to put put it in a perspective, there they are now with the next five years investing an amount into renewables equal to the value of Telenor. So it's $26 billion, so it's a huge figure. So, so when these big industrial players start to move, uh, and with the capital they have available, they can do very, very big things. And, and that, of course, that provides them with a role also in the energy transition. You see the same with Shell and BP uh, in, in Europe as well, take, taking big positions and, and probably moving into so, you know, a bit closer to the utilities and so, some some aspects, and and getting into that value chain as well. So, definitely think so. And and they also have now with the basically because of the low investments now you have high oil and gas prices. Um, you would have had that without the war in, in Russia as well. Then, then they have significant capital to to put at work elsewhere because they, their existing business is making a lot of money. But back to your you know your question, what can you do short term? I think what really uh, amounts to something is to make sure that we at least produce as much gas as possible and ship that to the continental Europe because we are sending or exporting roughly 1100 uh, terawatt hours and uh, and you know that's a huge amount of gas that we're sending to them we have to make sure that that is on full throttle all the time the electricity that we produce uh, for export is maybe uh, plus minus 15 terawatt hours. So in reality, it doesn't account to anything in order to solve the problem. And I've heard that um, there is a, you know, if the winter gets cold, you know, uh, Germany might not have enough electricity or gas this winter. So I think what the, you know, what the most important we do is make sure that we deliver on the gas side. Yeah. And, and this winter is sort of, that is the, what it lies closest ahead. But next winter will probably be even worse because we're starting off at a very low level next year. Yeah, we're basically hoping to get through this winter by drawing uh, every, all the storage we have. So, so then you, of course, get out of this winter with terrible position and then you have a few months to try to get that up again and that has, been sort of, yeah. that has been the narrative in the media as well that come, yeah, yeah but storage is back up at levels which is fine for the winter and everything is good that has sort of been some of the comments i read at least and I, th I think also what people have to keep in mind there which is obvious now and you see it in the pricing right gas is up i think 15 times uh, something like that uh, 
So it's uh, you, you, the, the market is telling you something there, but uh, the storage capacity is quite limited compared to consumption. So that storage has worked, um, but you shouldn't really look at historical graphs and say that oh now we have quite a good storage because it's the storage is so little of the total demand. So what has been saving us it's historically? It's twenty four percent or something, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So so what's been saving us historically has been that the gas has always been flowing, right? So you can okay it's a bit less some days than we take something from storage, but it's not like now when it's zero every day. So so, uh, so I, I completely agree with uh, with Lars over there. Um, Norway need to run the gas business at 110 percent. Equinor is doing that right now, but that need to continue. And you also saw um, Habeck here, the vice chancellor of, of Germany, mentioning, you know, thank you, thank you for the Norwegian gas. It's, they are totally dependent on it now to get through this winter. And it's uh, after all, it's about people, right? So Equinor. Uh, Back in the old days when they were proud of the of the gas deliveries and which they are again now after, after a couple of years with focusing on other things that they used to have on the homepage, you know that uh, that is heating and, and providing the energy for 160 million Europeans. So it is big numbers. It used to be a liability, right? Oh no, it's gas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a while. Uh, let's talk. I mean, it, given given that gas is very critical right now, it, we tend to speak a lot about gas. But let's touch upon oil as well. Have you we, have we we been naive in the same way? Given given the shale growth that we saw back in twelve thirteen, and I mean back to Trafigura's presentation yesterday obviously shown that rig count is up, Brent is at 100 to 120, but the production is basically not moving and the part of the production which is moving is Permian and all the other basins are, are down. And everybody's just waiting for shale to kind of save us all. Yeah, and it will be very exciting to see if that actually happens. I personally think that we have now under investors for a number of years. And that that will come into play in a big way anyway. So so everyone seems to think that shade can take take an, any kind of hit and increase volumes very rapidly. But uh, if you go back to, to the oil price downturn of 2014, it's, it's, it's a lot of focus on shale. But there was also a lot of other mega projects coming on stream at the same time. You know, uh, offshore Brazil, offshore West Africa, these kind of you know 500,000 barrels uh, per day in those years and, and that. That accounts for a lot, and today you have zero or close to zero of these projects. You have some in Brazil, but you, elsewhere there are no one investing in uh, something that has first oil in three to five years. So mm. that will be a big problem, in, in in my opinion. I think there will be a squeeze there, basically, uh, um, because we have now underinvested, and uh, that that is you know normal in the oil market. This is a cyclical market. You know, you have some very good years, you have some very bad years. Wouldn't you um, say, board, that if Given that how long this, these projects are, you need visibility because these are heavy investments. Shouldn't we strive to give Equinor and other players a 30-year contract on something so they can start to invest with visibility? Isn't that really the longer-term solution here instead of talking about price caps and etc.? Because we. Nobody will invest in a massive project without knowing what the returns will be two to three to four to five years from now. Oh, definitely. And, and uh, there has been no willingness from uh, customers to sign long term contracts. Uh, but I'm sure if you pay uh, $10 per MMBTU the next uh, 15 years, to secure that capacity, there there's a lot of projects to be built in in Norway. Uh, but the whole infrastructure is built up on the back of fixed price contracts. Uh, but it is, of course, a good point, right? Uh, you had uh, you had uh, long-term contracts, and then uh, you saw you didn't want that, and you, know, you had spot prices, price go down, and now. Uh, the market is undersupplied, and you want uh, there's call for price caps and long-term contracts again. Uh, but that's an important part of the solution because uh, Norwegian gas is cheap, it's reliable, it's affordable, um, much lower CO2 footprint than importing LNG from the US. Um, so, uh, so, uh, and and long-term contracts is is definitely uh, key to 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 making those kind of investments because oil you can ship right, uh, gas it's much more infrastructure. Uh, and, and there you have uh, 
you you will uh, to extend sort of uh, decrease the capital cost you 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 need longer term contracts and visibility so we discussed in a previous podcast uh, around the energy market in, in Norway uh, a bit what can be done on the demand side in terms of incentivizing people to change their windows, isolate their homes, solar on the roof, etc. Now we have been through the supply side, but obviously in the shorter term we, we, we probably need to reduce demand a little bit. Yeah, I think we do, and <coughs> I think that is already happening. Uh, but of course, uh, when the government now intervenes and and uh, give you 90% support, basically for power prices uh, plus uh, 70 or uh, plus uh, VAT, then obviously that is not uh, giving the full effect because then. You know, to be honest, some would say, well, you know, why should I save now? Because I'm in reality been bailed out by the government. But I guess that's, uh, you know, there, there is a demand there for that. Uh, and uh, also some would say that it shouldn't be 70. It should be actually a maximum price of 50 or even lower. That doesn't make sense at all. Uh, we have to uh, be more careful in how we use electricity. And price is a signal that most people over time will understand. And that's why you cannot totally insulate uh, this. So in reality, we need to do short term, um, call it uh, changes in behavior. Uh, I think that uh, we will probably have to install, uh, you know, air to air uh, pumps uh, because that's very efficient. But I think also that, uh, you know, if the prices really, really will move high and we get to, into a rationing situation, then I also think that um, we have in reality 35 terawatt hours of energy intensive consumption in Norway. And these, some of these have already started to reduce slightly. Uh, hydro has taken down capacity on, on two of the plants and Alcoa on one of the plants. And obviously, this is something that we will see happening long a uh, long time before you are uh, actually being cut off for, for electricity. So I think we have the, so we have the industry uh, flexibility but also you know, consumer in general and companies need to be more careful on how they uh, use their electricity. It's the same in Europe, right, where 72% of the fertilizer production is already down because it's not economically viable to, to keep that production alive. Yeah, uh, and I think, I think one point that's important to remember when we talk about the price signal as well is, is the underlying theme of the podcast energy security, what does that fundamentally mean is that you're trying to achieve a situation where you have access to electricity, right? So, so you know, why are prices so high? It's, it's to force an action that makes sure that you have access during the winter, actually. That it's because, you know, the, the alternative is that you, you don't have any power in the house, basically. That's what's happening in Europe now. That's why you're shutting down and the price signal is working in that effect. So, so I think that's important for people that don't spend a lot of time on, on the, these issues is, is to grasp that you know we are so used to and especially in Norway you know access to cheap energy and it is there every day it is in, something we take for granted yeah we take it for granted and in Europe now there is a clear risk you know that uh, you turn on the light in the morning in Germany this winter and nothing happens you know that that's the reality of the situation that's what they're working to resolve of course I think you know they they as well with shutting down the industry and th things like that will will help a lot they, they will get through the manner to the, through the winter but it will be painful of course and, and also a little bit back to I mean the situation uh, for, for rationing uh, right now obviously 2022 has been an extreme year in the way that we have so much uh, rain water uh, up north and there, in reality nothing on the south so uh, we are now at the reservoir level that is lower than it has been over the last 20 years, while up north it's the other way around, higher than it has been for 20 years. Uh, obviously, and, and the problem is we're not able to shift that surplus from the north to the south. So that also, uh, you know, uh, calls for increasing the grid capacity so that in reality we do not have uh, price areas in Norway as we have now. Because we have now seen, you know, uh, times, hours where there's been 10, 20, 30, 40 times difference between uh, a power price in, let's say, Tromsø and Kristiansand. And that shouldn't really happen. 
I think we uh, should start to round things off. So, uh, Bor, if you can start off with some closing remarks. Um, no, I, I mean... Uh, I'll put you on the spot there. Yeah, you definitely did. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think one, ch one thing we should include there that sometimes gets lost is why do we talk about gas? Why do we talk about electricity? And why is oil kind of something separate? It's the use. I mean, that's important uh, to, to, to have there. So gas is used to produce electricity in Europe. Gas is used for heating, where we in Norway use electricity. Uh, just that's what, why we're talking about those two things. And that's why gas is so important for the power market. So gas 